Hello, everybody. Sorry, thank you for waiting a couple of minutes. So we're gonna we're gonna start now. As I said, I'm if you heard me earlier, I'm based in Kale in the middle of thunderstorm and lightning, but we're still here to bring you an update on what happened in the budget yesterday, um, which obviously wasn't quite as exciting as we thought, and what our views are into 2024 and a roundup of what happened in 2023. And I'm really pleased to be joined today by Richard Donnell, who's, um, who many of you know, he did, a, he did our update to the last budget. He's a research director at Zoopla, which is possibly the biggest portal in the UK. He's been in London property for 25 years, almost as long as me, um, starting at Savills, which I didn't. And um, today he's here going to give us an update um, on yesterday's budget, which sadly, as I said, wasn't as exciting as we'd hoped. And then he's going to give us a roundup on 2023 and the outlook, looking at the figures for 2024. And then at the end, we're going to come back and answer questions. So on your screen, there should be a Q&A function. So if you want to click that and leave a, leave a question that relates to property, please, or the budget, then we'll be happy to answer them. So that's me, done. I'm over to you, Richard, if you want to take over and give you helpful insights. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, fantastic to be here. Uh, and again, um, thanks for the invite to, to pick up on where we are on the, on the UK and, and London housing markets. As you say, uh, not a hugely eventful budget, but I think there's an important story to tell about how London is, is, is developing. Um, so on the first slide, I just wanted to sort of cover off kind of where we are in terms of the budget. Uh, and I, you know, as, as Mark's alluded, it wasn't huge on on changes in housing, but it was quite big on on improvements to the economy, putting money back in people's pockets, and I think also trying to make the UK uh, a place that's attractive for international businesses to invest. Um, some interesting tax allowances that have been made permanent. You know, we've got already got the removal of the banker's bonus. So again, I think that the UK government in a, in a post-Brexit world is all about how do we make sure we've got business, global capital coming into, into the UK, and a lot of that will flow into London. And again, anything that puts money back in the pockets of consumers is ultimately going to have a benefit on, on the housing market. It's going to support affordability for people looking to buy homes. It's going to support affordability for people looking to rent homes. Uh, and as I say, this this place to do business is kind of what we need uh, after a period of, of, of turmoil geopolitically and politically in recent years. So turning to the housing market, I think the big story on the next slide is, is what's happening to the demand for homes for purchase. And um, you know, the big story, I guess, over the last few years has been first we had the Brexit um, uh, vote in 2016. Then we had the pandemic hitting in 2020, just as the market looked set to take off. And the pandemic created a huge amount of demand for housing. A lot of British people were looking to sort of reconsider the homes they wanted. We had a stamp duty holiday. And then more recently, as the pandemic effects started to wane, we then have had higher mortgage rates over the last year or so that's had an impact on buying power. And this chart here basically shows just how many how many sales applicants, how many people are getting in touch with estate agents in London and across the rest of England um, with estate agents expressing an interest in buying property? And it's a rolling seven day index. Um, the long run average is 100. And you can see there those sort of 2018, 2019, we had the usual seasonal patterns of demand. Then things really got going after the 2019 general election. We had a real bounce back, particularly in London. Um, and then, and sadly, we had the COVID impacts. But again, as soon as the lockdown ended, we had these peaks over 2020, 2021, 2022 of incredibly strong demand for housing. Homes were literally flying off the shelves. House prices were rising. Uh, and again, there were various stimulations over that point through stamp duty and other things. But ever since about a year ago with a mini budget in 2022, October 2022, Mortgage rates were rising and then rose up to about five or six percent for a typical home buyer. That suppressed demand. It had a real weakening to the this time last year. The market was quite weak in terms of demand as people were unsure as we shifted from a period of ultra cheap money to more expensive borrowing costs. But again, you can see in the first part of this year, you know, demand did get back in line with the long run average. 
um, again, a bit more so in London uh, than England. And then, but ever since uh, the summer, since mortgage rates went back up again to around about 6%, 5.5%, you know, demand's been muted, but it's sort of in line with this time of year over the sort of pre-pandemic periods. It's it's not like it's sort of uh, dropping considerably. And look, there are fewer buyers in the market in total, but there are still deals being done. And that's what we look at on the next slide. You know, how many sales are being agreed? You can have fewer people in the market, but you can still have deals being done. And that's what really matters. That tells us about the overall health of the market. So this is a very similar index over the last five years. It looks at the number of new sales being agreed, homes going what's called sold subject to contract in London in purple, the rest of England and the UK in, in, the, in the pink line. Again, less volatile than demand because over the pandemic, there was a shortage of properties. People were chasing multiple homes at once. This is a more stable line, but again, it's still very seasonal. It shows you those strong pandemic years, second half of 2020, first part of 21, then 2022. But again, interestingly, even with higher mortgage rates and that weak weak end to last year, people came back into the market as mortgage rates fell back to 4.2% this spring. You can see there that sales agreed are above the long run average or the five year average. But again, there's always a seasonal slowdown the second half of the year. Um, that was amplified by mortgage rates going back up again. <clears throat> but as mortgage rates have started to drift lower, and I think the average five-year fixed rate mortgage in the UK now at a 75% loan to value is um, it's now getting less than 5%. So we've got sub 5% money coming back onto the table. And again, sales have actually picked up. And so we've got sales running actually above the pre-pandemic average at the moment. And again, we've seen a particular pickup in London, I think, and we'll talk about London in more detail in a minute. Um, but look, deals are being done. Um, there's willing buyers, willing sellers. Sellers are having to negotiate or give more on price, um, particularly through buyers paying a greater or paying a smaller proportion of the asking price. But there's enough room to negotiate that it's supporting the market. So on the next slide, we look at um, just what's happened to house price inflation. Now, this is just a snapshot across the whole of the UK so each of these dots or these circles is a postcode area. Um, postcode, there's 122 dots on here going from the very north of Scotland right the way down to the very south of the, of the UK and England. Um, and what we've got here is just a snapshot view of what are average house prices in these markets along the horizontal axis um, and what is on the vertical axis, which is annual house price inflation. Uh, not sure what's quite happened to the decimals, but these are hundreds of thousands of pounds, basically. There's a, dec a, a, a comma's gone in. Um, it's not 8 million, it's, it's 800,000, 900,000 on the very right-hand side. And most importantly here, in a London, you know, London's a more expensive housing market, average house price is over half a million pounds. And you can, I've just called out a few of the parts of London there, West Central London, East Central London in the city, West London, going all the way out to Heathrow, Southwest London, Northwest London, Katie's Kingston, and N is North London. And so, you know, house prices are down up to 2%. Um, but what we're not seeing is an acceleration in price falls in these more expensive markets. What's actually happening is prices are falling a little bit above average in what you would call sort of commuter land and the accessible areas around London, the southeast of England, the Colchesters and the Canterbury's. And these are markets where house prices went up a lot over the pandemic as people were chasing down three and four bed family houses, the so-called race for space. And again, prices are just sort of coming off a high base. And so when we look at the overall seller in the market in the UK at the moment, you know, even if they're having to take slightly lower prices when they're selling, you know, the average house prices are sort of more than... 30, 40,000 pounds higher than they were before the pandemic. So there's more room to negotiate. There's more equity for people to negotiate. And I think what we have seen in the last few weeks is, is pricing firming in London. Um, uh, and again, I've got some reasons why that's happening. But again, London London's tended to underperform the market in recent years, but it's looking much better value for money now. So again, an EC London, the city, with a return to work, offices starting to fill up much more now, um, you know, that's actually just moved positive in terms of house price growth. So I think this pattern is going to continue in the short term. Now, on the next slide, we, we talked about um, the overall trends in London house price growth. This is a this is a house price index looking at London as a whole. 
and then looking at some of the big postcode areas in London, so East London, North London, South East London, South West London, West London, just as a selection, and comparing that to the United Kingdom, which is the black line. And so, you know, since uh, the end of the global financial crisis, uh, more than sort of 10, 12 years ago, you can just see how London led the recovery up into 2013, 2014. Then it went even higher by 2015, 2016. And again, the market really, you know, almost house prices almost doubled in price over that period, 20, 2009 to 2015, 2016. Then we had a series of tax changes. We've had the events that we've talked about that have seen London prices, they've gone up, but they've sort of tended to go more sideways than really going up at the same speed. I mean, the level to which prices were going up was probably couldn't be sustained. In 2014, house prices went up 20%. So we've just seen more sustainable levels of growth in recent years. But meanwhile, the rest of the United Kingdom has just caught up, basically. But I think this 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 slower growth in the rest of the UK has made has started to improve housing affordability in London. It's improved accessibility. And that's one of the reasons that even though London's got the highest house prices and mortgage rates have gone up, we haven't seen a big drop in house prices. Um, Part of that reason as well is the Bank of England, like many other central banks around the world, in, in the mid, in around about 2015, 2016, the Bank of England introduced some quite tough new mortgage affordability rules because it was worried that ultra cheap money would just feed straight into house prices, lead to a boom, and then potentially create the risk of a bust. And so part of this sort of uh, much weaker growth in London was the impact of those regulations almost stopping um, people overpaying for housing and making prices more sustainable. So people are in a much better position to be able to absorb higher mortgage rates than they might have been in previous cycles in, say, um, you know, the late 1980s. So London's in an, an OK position. Again, I think it's one of the reasons why house price inflation is, is actually doing better than other parts of the UK. But having said that, as we look at the next slide, you know, as I said, sellers are having to accept um, bigger discounts when they're agreeing purchases. Now, typically in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, not Scotland in the, in the UK, but typically in London and England, um, homes are marketed with an asking price. And then typically people will make an offer of you know, typically lower than the asking price. And this chart simply plots the UK average discount from the asking price to what's actually agreed. So over time, um, across the whole of the UK, this is not just a London line, um, it's been about three to 4% um, less than the asking price is typically the agreed price. But you can see how this line got to zero or got to 100%. So over those pandemic years, when there was such strong demands, people were basically paying the asking price all the way through. And then since the mini budget late last year, the gaps just returned again to more normal levels. Now in London at the moment, it's about a 6% gap, about a 94% of the asking price being achieved. Now, asking prices have hardly fallen. So what's really happening is that weaker demand, the hit to buying power from higher mortgage rates is really being expressed through this gap opening up more than headline prices rising. And so that the chart I just showed you of headline prices in those two previous charts, you know, prices have pretty much gone sideways. They're down maybe a percent or so, a percent or two. There's not a lot. So this is what's happening. And again, the good news is this gap is not unsustainably large. And so people are doing deals, which is then supporting sales rates. And again, as I said earlier, the average homeowner's home in the UK is about £40,000 more uh, than it was before the pandemic. So people do have equity to negotiate with. You know, It's not like people have got uh, large mortgages and there's this fears of negative equity. There's a lot of equity in the UK housing market, and that's making it particularly resilient at the moment. So as you look at the next slide, ultimately, this is all about you know, what, the, what's really been hit more than prices in, in the housing market is, is liquidity or the number of housing transactions. So this chart shows you UK housing transactions in millions um, over the last 50 years or so. Um, it shows you the long run average is 1.2 million. Uh, last year in 2022, we had 1.3 million transactions. That was above average. We had 1.5 million in 2021, when that post-pandemic boom really kicked off. And this year, we're on track for about a million sales. That's a 23% drop in sales this year. Um, and again, the real squeeze here is coming through on, on sort of a 30% decline in people buying a with a mortgage, because obviously the cost of mortgages has gone up. And actually, we're seeing cash buyer numbers um, hold broadly flat. 
And you know, given the current outlook, uh, notwithstanding what was in the autumn statement yesterday, um, you know, we think we're going to see about a million to 1.1 million transactions. So we we're just seeing the market adjust to to higher borrowing costs. Um, again, it's not through big price falls. We've got incomes and earnings rising quite quickly in the UK at the moment. The average average earnings are up by over seven percent um, over the last year. And again, the autumn statements just given everyone a sort of two percent um, sort of uh, cut to to a form of income tax. So again, that's going to start improving affordability, and hopefully next year, as mortgage rates start to fall, um, we'll see more you know more buyers come back into the market. And so there are, there is some upside to that outlook for transaction volumes. But this is this is where the real hit has been. It's not really been in prices. And again, a lot of analysts a year ago called it wrong. Um, you know, they, they just thought there'd be a huge drop in house prices with mortgage rates going up. They thought there'd be a sort of return of transaction volumes back to sort of 2009 levels. That just hasn't happened. And again, I think what they probably missed was the fact that these rules that have been put in place by the Bank of England and banks has really sort of provided a lot of insulation uh, to the market. So as we go to the next slide, as we turn to the lettings market, um, you know, the rental market, Probably about one in three homes in London is a rented property. Um, you know, a lot of private landlords, overseas landlords owning property for rent. Again, the rental market is almost totally the opposite to the sales market. Um, so two charts here to describe what's going on on the left hand chart. This is the number of homes for rent per, uh, per, per estate agent uh, branch on Zoopla. And we have about 85 percent of all homes for rent in London on Zoopla. Um, and you can see that the big story here is both across England and in London, we just we just have far fewer homes for rent than we've seen before the pandemic. Um, that big spike in London in 2020 was the impact of the pandemic, ceasing of international travel, working from home and offices, a lot of short lets and holiday lets and Airbnb properties were put back on the, the longer let market. So there was a big increase in supply. Um, but then all of that has been absorbed now as the economy reopened in 2021. And again, there's been a bit of a recovery in supply. And again, I think there's quite a lot of new build apartments are being bought for rent out, both through corporates and private landlords. But again, levels of available supply are, are nowhere near where they were before the pandemic kicked in. And across the rest of England, you know, there was a scarcity of homes for rent. Now, a scarcity of homes for rent then is is in the face of much stronger demand. And so the chart on the right hand side is just how many inquiries we're seeing on Zoopla for each home that's for rent. And this is crazy, quite a headache for, for agents dealing with this huge volume of people that have been looking to rent property. And again, you can see 2021, 20, sorry, 2022 was a particularly strong year, um, getting up to 30, 35 inquiries for every home for rent in London. And really, this is driven by three things. Um, number one, we've had the UK has seen almost record amounts of international migration into the UK. Most more and more of it coming from outside of the Eurozone, so rest of the world migration. We had the Hong Kong uh, British nationals overseas passport holders have, 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 have been able to move back into the UK. And again, a lot of people who come into the UK through migration will tend to rent before they look to buy. Um, We've also had the government loosening off visa rules for, for students, both full-time students, but also postgraduates. So again, that's that's really also fueled that record migration number. And again, there's not enough purpose-built student homes in the UK. So that demand has overspilled into the into the wider private rented sector. And then the other thing is over the last year, it's just got way more expensive for a first-time buyer to buy their first home because mortgage rates have gone from 2% to 55 or 6%. So that's kept people in the rental market. So that's stopped the flow of homes coming back on the market, but it's also boosted demand as well. And so all these factors are, are driving really strong demand for rented housing, which is pushing up rents, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, so the, this chart is looking at, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, this chart shows year on year rental growth in London, and the rest of the UK, excluding London. Um, now, this is for new lets. This is when a property has become vacant today, and it was vacant three years ago. You know, how has the rent reset to the market level? And typically, over time, rents tend to track earnings. Um, that's sustainable rental growth. And so, rental growth was pretty benign. You know, naught to five percent um, over the, over the sort of period 2013 to 2020. 
The drop in London rents over 2020 was largely because of the impact of the pandemic, that big increase in supply, weaker demand. But now, as the economy reopened in 2021, a huge rebound in rents, all those losses were offset. And actually, rental growth is still running in, and has been running for some time now in double digits in London for new lets because of this scarcity of supply, strong demand, both from international immigration, but also domestic uh, strength of demand as offices reopen and people get back to work. Uh, and then across the rest of the UK, um, rental growth has been sort of running along at around 10% year on year. And again, that's been ahead of earnings growth, which has been closer to 6 or 7%. So these are high. They're not totally unsustainable. They're not unsustainable because, you know, uh, earnings have been rising quickly. And if we double click on that in more detail on the next slide, um, you can just get a snapshot here of what's happening. So the chart on the left-hand side is just at the, the same chart, annual rental growth for new lets, but across some major cities. So Birmingham, Bristol, Edinburgh, Leeds, and Manchester. So again, some of these cities saw weaker demand over the pandemic and rents fell to a, to a lesser degree than in London. Again, I think that was largely to do with the far fewer holiday lets, short lets, properties available. Um, rental growth rebounded, and again, it's still running at sort of 8, 9, 10% uh, per annum, all the way up to 15% in Edinburgh. Um, again, in Scotland, the Scottish government has tried to control the pace at which rents have, have, have risen. A lot of things, anything around rent controls tends to backfire, and it's that's absolutely the case in Edinburgh here, where rental growth actually going up, not down. Um, and again, hopefully the Scottish government will, will change and reverse some of those policies. If we focus on London on the right hand, slide it's very much a difference between real inner london a sort of central areas zone one two and three on the tube you know sort of half an hour commute from from the middle of town from the center of town to then this sort of outer area so i'm comparing tower hamlets here which is really canary wharf area, the great canary wharf area westminster's in the heart of london you know rents fell in those areas and then have rebounded very strongly and again they're slowing but they're slowing back to more sustainable levels in outer London, the likes of Croydon, where there's a lot of built to rent happening, Hounslow's out there, Heathrow Airport, you know, these outer boroughs didn't see the big drop in rents over the pandemic. They didn't see as big a bounce back, but net net rents are up by broadly the same amount in all areas. And I think we think rental growth is just going to moderate to more normal levels as, as earnings growth slows, um, affordability pressures build, you know, rental growth is just going to slow back to, to more sustainable levels. Now, part of this is um, linked to what landlords are doing and what they're thinking. And so, you know, the yield you get from property is one important consideration. So this chart here just shows gross yields over the last 10 years by regions of the UK. And we've got London there on the right hand side. And so as house prices have fallen a little bit down by 2%, rents are rising by 10, 12% year on year. We've seen a, a rebound in rents, uh, yield, sorry, which is what you'd expect uh, with higher borrowing costs. And so the sort of overall return for investors is improving. Uh, the question, and I'm sure Mark can cover this, is sort of, you know, what, what level of yield is, is correct? Um, what's going to bring more people back into the market, et cetera? But, but the good news is that yields are improving and they're going to keep improving uh, because I think, you know, rents are certainly going to outpace uh, house prices over 2024, particularly in London, as well as across the rest of the UK. Now, landlords are also thinking about financing costs. And again, I think higher mortgage rates have hit landlords particularly hard uh, when it comes to, to uh, sort of their decisions as they come to refinance. Most landlords in the UK are on a five-year fixed rate mortgage. It's normally interest only. Um, but again, they need to think about the sort of cash flow from that property and, and what the right level of debt is and then what they do when they come to refinance. And again, this is some work we did on just, well, how much finance and how big a mortgage is do landlords have? And so um, our view is that you know, well, two in five landlords have no borrowings whatsoever. They just own the property outright. A further third have got a small mortgage of less than 50 percent loan to value. Um, but really, it's in that purple section there. It's about 30% of landlords who've got much higher loan-to-value mortgages, typically more than 50% loan-to-value. That's where the real hit from uh, mortgage rates has been. And again, the, the British media have got lots of tales about there's an exodus of landlords on the market. That, that's not true. Um, there are certainly some landlords looking to sell up, um, but they're, they're making perfectly rational decisions around 
running costs of the property, levels of inflation, the outlook for house prices and returns. So I think there's there's more, I think people are rationalizing their portfolios and thinking harder and clearer about what they really want to buy and the returns they want, because, you know, investing in property is a long-term game. Uh, and so the chart on the next page sort of looks into the sort of the challenge either a new buyer has or a someone refinancing has as they think about a, about a property. And so what this is simply doing is saying, let's assume we're all thinking about buying a typical uh, rented property in London, average price of just over half a million pounds. Uh, and the average rent, which on the next click, please, um, is just around about £2,000 per month. And so the, the black line here is, is, um, is what's the rent that this property's uh, kicking off. Um, but then depending on our loan to value of our mortgage, so we go from 25% to 75%, the grey bars show what a typical landlord's mortgage interest payments would have been at 3% mortgage rates, typically where people have been over the last three or four years. But now as they come to refinance or consider buying a brand new property, five and a half percent is typically speaking the kind of mortgage interest payments uh, that you have to pay on a buy to let. So that's a five and a half and that's the purple bars. Now, there's still a gap between the rent and the purple bars. But the other thing you need to factor in is that a bank um, or UK banks, if you're a UK landlord or potentially borrowing with UK finance, they have a limit saying, look, we want to allow for your running costs and your tax. So actually, we're happy to lend you the money, but the maximum interest payments you're allowed, um, you know, your rent needs to be 125% of your interest payments, at least for a lower rate taxpayer in the UK. Or if you're a higher rate taxpayer in the UK on your, on your income, then actually the rent has got to be at least 145% of your interest payments and if you click again the green line comes up so if we're a higher rate taxpayer in the uk the green dotted line here says that's the maximum amount of interest payments that your bank will let you borrow at so it really means if you're buying a typical average property in london you know you have to be putting in probably you know 50 55 60 percent of equity um just to make the numbers add up basically um but obviously, you know, you could have put in more equity um, when more interest rates are much lower. So this this just highlights the challenge for people is a, as they come to refinance, uh, particularly for people with higher loan to value mortgages. And it's the people with higher loan to value mortgages that are more likely to be selling. They tend to be snapped up by their investors, maybe first time buyers as well. Um, but again, hopefully, as mortgage rates uh, start to fall uh, next year, then some of this refinancing for those with higher mortgage rates uh, starts to uh improve and again we've got, meanwhile we've got that that black line still rising at 10 percent year on year so you know the pure the ongoing increase in rents is going to support these these numbers but there's just a bit of a squeeze for some landlords at the moment so we've covered the sales and lettings market on this final slide just wanted to give you a summary uh, i think from what we've seen particularly those charts those index charts i think london is looking much better value for money um, house prices and incomes in London have really realigned quite a lot over the last five or six years. Um, it is a buyer's market, um, there, but there are deals to be done. I think there's some probably great deals to be done at the moment. And again, I think sellers have got rooms to negotiate on price. So again, there's, there's opportunities. We've talked about house price growth remaining flat into Q1 next year. We've talked about rental growth uh, returning to more normal levels, but over the long run, rents do track earnings. And that's why a lot of people love holding property and holding it as part of a pension, because over the long run, you do get that alignment to earnings growth. And ultimately, you know, whether we're looking at London, you know, London is a, is, is a big global city, often comes at the top of rankings for livability. You know, the government is clearly trying to get a lot more investment coming into the UK, where a lot of that will also come into London. So... For me, I guess investing in the health of, of London's housing market is really sort of what's London's position as a global city and how much jobs, how much employment, you know, how much incomes rise is is is, is set to sort of drive the market forward. And I think after a few uh, fallow years, uh, the outlook is, is certainly looking better. Mark, over to you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Richard. So um, I just want to cap on a couple of bits. I mean, this is a Ben and Reeves slide, if you don't know us, what we do. 
We've been going 65 years. We have 35 branches, one here in KL. We have 14 overseas. And we're mainly assisting investors and second homeowners buying in London. And, and the circle on the right of this slide shows you what we do. That's from buying to handover and snagging to furnishing and then letting management tax returns because if you're overseas whether you own a property whether you have any tax to pay sorry or not you've still got to do a tax return and then to exit we help you sell and we help you buy more so that's a little bit about what we do but interesting enough i've been doing talks recently while i've been out here and and one of the things i think people often forget and i think rich did quite clearly say that is that you know, let's be honest, the UK is an education. There are, th there are three key things that everybody loves about the UK and why it's a good place to invest. It's a hub of education. 450,000 students study in the UK. It's a financial hub. You know, it's possibly, arguably, the world's strongest financial services sector. And thirdly, it's a cultural hub, which is what everybody loves. And that's why what Richard's shown here, the market very steady in terms of London property. And for lots of investors who live in Asia or the Middle East, um, you're not used to a stable market. Prices boom up and then they crash down. And we just haven't seen that. And Richard's figures, I think they've really shown that, that the market is so steady. The one thing I do love that he talked about is the rental market quite so much. And it is I can tell you from the ground level. So Rich does it from an analytics level. I do it from sitting in a branch and going around and seeing what, what we're seeing. You know, the rental market is the same phrase if you watch my, my vlogs. It's red hot and it continues to be red hot. And I think a great slide Richard has about the number of inquiries they have. 25 average inquiries they have today compared with eight when it was in 2019, when the market was normal. 25, that's three times the number of people. And it's for the reasons that Richard said, you know, students, you know, domestic renters who can't afford to buy, migration. I don't think he mentioned the stat, but 600,000 migrants came into the UK in the last year. Um, and the fourth thing he didn't mention is the work from home reversal of that. We're seeing an awful lot of people that moved out of London that have come back into London now because it's so expensive commuting and then they have to sell their property and so they're renting and all these factors are putting so much strain on our already very tight stock. Um, and, and interestingly for us, our stat is actually over 30, 30 inquiries um, per, per, per property. So it's quite interesting. But one of the questions, so I've, a few people have asked a few questions. So one of the questions that was quite interesting, maybe Richard, you could do this. What's the difference between the autumn statement and the budget? I think the autumn statement is more of a sort of summary of the, I, don't know, I, I think the autumn statement is more of a summary of the finances. The budget is still the, when the Finance Act is signed to sort of an act changes. So uh, the budget's the important one when things actually change. The autumn statement is more around the statement of public finances and then the intent to change things, basically. Yeah, I think so. So so, so let's be honest. Do you think that, so Jeremy Hunt, if you don't already know, is our current chancellor. I don't know how long because we seem to change chancellors quite a lot. Um, do you think he saved the best for March? Do you think that's what he's done? He's kept it all in his pockets pre-election and it's going to come next year. Is that what you think? Yeah, I didn't actually even mention the election, but I think that's quite a big thing that could happen next 100%. year. I think, um, look, I mean, there's now speculation this morning in the British media that, you know, is the, is the Chancellor of the Exchequer and Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, sort of contemplating a, a spring election and going early rather than next this time next year. So I think, as he said himself, he's going to see how these announcements, because, again, some of them are, um, are going to become into, into force uh, shortly, um, he's going to see how the British economy is doing, particularly the outlook for inflation, how quickly you know, borrowing stock costs start to come down next year, and almost sort of reserve judgment that he might go further in the budget if he needed to. But I think they're, they're optimistic that things could get better quicker in 2024. And again, I don't think, again, Brit British governments don't like going autumn, winter elections. They tend to like spring elections, basically. Yeah. So, um, But they're well behind in the polls. And I think... You know, there are some parts of the property industry, particularly house building and developers, who 
there's quite a lot of people who are waiting to see what happens with the election. So, yeah. you know, a surprise one getting it out of the way could hopefully provide more of a boost to the market afterwards. But I think I think there is some positivity coming because of the massive drop in inflation, right? And I think that's quite good. And we've already seen. I mean, someone just asked a question about rates, interest rates. I mean, we've already seen after the inflation dropped to four point six percent, and there is going to be. I think it's going to continue to come off running running up to Christmas. Um, um, someone's already asked, do they think the prices, you know, uh, will pick up in twenty twenty four now that mortgage rates are dropping? Um, and continue and, and earnings continue to go up. What do you think about that, Richard? I think I think what's most likely to happen is, is I think our view is mortgage rates, again, the average mortgage rate currently just over five will end next year at sort of four and a half. Again, four percent mortgage rates are still it's still cheap money by historic standards, not necessarily the ultra cheap money we had. The first thing that's going to improve is transaction volumes, you know, getting more liquidity into the market, getting more people moving, I think is the most important thing. Um Again, I'm not sure everyone wants a huge amount of house price inflation. I think house prices tickling, tickling upwards is fine. Um, and again, particularly if you've got a really strong rental growth. Um, I think you know we just need to let a year or two's worth of incomes growth still keep powering through. Uh, again, if we stay at 4.5% mortgage rates, then there's some upside for house prices. But again... I think a lot. If I was an investor, I'd really be focusing on buying properties that have got fantastic cash flow upside, strength of rental growth, low running costs. Again, I, th- I think there's a shift happening in the UK where investors used to be very focused on house price inflation, less so rental growth. Whereas I think a lot of the new money coming into the market now is yeah. is really focused on the strength of cash flow. I mean, if you can get an asset where the underlying rental income is rising at six or seven percent per annum compound, I mean that's that's fantastic. <laughs> I, I, th- I think I, I, I agree with that. Actually, what, what we see as a business, it's obviously we're, we're in prime areas of London, but actually where investors are looking at and where, we, where we're seeing real growth and investors coming in is into the, the kind of outer areas, so three, zone, four, zone, five, five and, and, and a little bit further out where you can get six to seven percent rental yield. Now, even looking at your graph there, if you're getting six to seven percent rental yield, you know, you, you can afford, even if you're a higher rate taxpayer at 145%, you can you can pretty much afford to get a 65%, 70% loan. I'm not saying you should, because actually we try to recommend people take 55 to 60 just to give you a decent buffer. But the, the re- yields that you can get on outside, outside London is we've, we've, we've for ages been saying, focus on the yield. Don't just focus on capital growth, because... You don't know where it's going to come, and especially what we've had over the last eight years. But I, I, I think it's very interesting, and I think you can get good. Um, I think you can get good, strong yields at the moment, as you say, with low costs. If you buy a new build, you've got no cost for the for the for the next five years. So I, I think that's very interesting. Um, what do, so do, so do you think that there's a different? What oh, this is a good question. Someone asked, why is there a difference between Bank of England base rate and mortgage rates? Um. Well, it depends. I mean, you can get a mortgage rate that's pegged to or related to uh, the interest rate. But um, typically, most people in the UK take um, two or five year money. And so as soon as you start looking at money over a period of time, then you have to reference financial markets and where they think rates are. And then effectively, we know what's the cost of a bank buying buying five year fixed rate money. They then need to add a margin on the top. So that's why there's a difference. Um, the two things move slightly separately. Um, but again, I think the vast majority of people in the UK tend to, to buy with fixed rate loans. A lot more people now are taking two year fixes, almost paying that little bit extra now, but hoping in you know in 18 months time rates will be lower when they come to refinance. Yeah. A lot of lenders are offering sort of two year variable rates. So they're sort of giving people the ability to just kind of lock in to maybe seeing rates go down. And then some people are still taking five-year fixes. And again, at the moment, I mean, for a 60% loan to value, there's a building society yesterday announced 4.43 for a 60% five-year fixed rate mortgage. Again, that's that's pretty cheap. That's for a, you might you might want to add that's for a home user, the UK yeah. UK domestic buyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I, I think it was interesting, after the inflation rate dropped the other, the other day, we saw HSBC, Halifax and and five lenders dropping the dropping the interest rate, and I think that was interesting. And 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 I think I think a lot of people are 
confused why the Bank of England says 5.25 and then some banks are charging 8%. But I, I think that's more. That's because of the margin that people get away with charging. I think that's quite interesting. This is quite an interesting question. So the, are people getting decent sales price discounts on asking prices and does it differ area to area? So uh, let me let me just have a go and then you can do that, Richard. But I mean, yeah, it differs area to area in London what you can get. But people have wild ideas, like our press does, about a crashing property market, about the discounts that are possible. You can't get a 20% discount in this market. It just doesn't exist. And if you do, you know, you're, you're, there's usually some reason why, that, why that's possible. But, you know, I think there are differences in different parts of the country. It depends on demand. It depends on the product. During COVID, if you were trying to buy a family house, you weren't getting any discount at all, as opposed to if you're buying a small studio flat with no outside space. But I, th I think it does differ area to area, but also, more importantly, pro you know, type of property to type of property, don't you think? Absolutely. I think um, I think there was a chart in the deck that had the, the discount to the asking price, and it's been averaging nationally. It's, sort of, it's about 5% now, basically. Um, in London, it's just around about 6 on average. As Mark says, I mean, when we look at the data, one in five sellers is having to get a discount of more than 10. But again, that typically means they've overcooked the asking price uh, yeah. or you're misread it or haven't taken the advice of their agent or really thought hard because um, the asking price is merely a guide. Ultimately, it's what someone's prepared to pay. So there is a gap. Um, it's grown, but it's gone back to kind of normal levels. And again, I think the message to anyone selling is speak to your agent um, yeah, price you know, it right. Get some honest advice about what it's what it's really likely to go for, and then have a have a debate with them about where to pitch it. But um, no one wants to get less than they might think they could get. But again, there's a little bit of a danger if you if you overprice and the property sticks, then everyone can sort of see it. It knows it's sticking, and they might try it's it like on a bit afterwards. So, so getting it right to start with is is much better uh, way to go. Here's this is interesting. It's just Someone's asked a couple of questions about first investment into the UK and first property price, first property purchase, sorry. And they're saying, what do you think would be best to buy a first property in London or invest in like a property business? I assume they mean by um, like a portfolio in London and Bristol. What do you think would be the best to buy London for your home first or the investment first? I think... Um... If, you, if you're from just a purely investment perspective, I think there's a lot to be said for London, just because the the strength, the, the size of the cash flow, the level of rent, um, I, and the fact it's a global city and it's it's underperformed. I still think London looks attractive, but equally, you know, with higher mortgage rates and borrowing costs, I think, yeah. If, if I if I want to chase rental growth and yield and cash flow, I probably would always invest in London. I think you go to regional cities if you want to get some outperformance in capital growth. But again, they they definitely have outperformed London over the last five or six years. But the question yeah. is, they got more house price growth to come. The the rents are much lower. The cash flow is strong, but the sort of volume and value of the rent is much lower. So again, um, but obviously buying in London is expensive, as Mark said. If you have to put in 50, 60, 50 or forty percent equity, that's that's a lot of money compared to another city. So I think. The London versus other cities in the UK, a lot of it is how, how much equity have you got to put in to kind of make the numbers yeah. work. But my, if you had the money, I would always probably start with London. I would always stick with the capital city. I tell you, I don't, personally, I own quite a lot. I buy stuff. I bought two properties this year, so I believe in the market. I don't own anything outside London because I think London's the capital city and where you should see consistently sustained growth. But someone did, end, interestingly enough, I was in... I was I was in Singapore last week, and someone there, there's been a new scheme launched in Manchester where one bedrooms it's the W residences in Manchester four hundred thirty five thousand pounds for one bedroom flat in Manchester. I mean, you can buy in zone two in London for that. It just I just think that's very specific product, and it's and it's expensive. And why would you not buy in the capital city? That's my view. And in fact, someone else has asked a question here. I've purchased a 25% stake in a Manchester property development, which completes in 2026. With the hope the railway line will be completed. Given the fact the railway line is no longer coming, should I still go ahead and complete it with a mortgage and rent it out or sell the 25% stake and invest elsewhere? That's a good question, Richard. What would you do? 
obviously we're not here to give investment advice, uh, but uh, look, I think the it's all, at the end of the day, if you're investing in Manchester, just like we said about London, you're investing in the Manchester economy, which has been very, very strong. You know, it's the second city of the UK. It's got a huge amount going on. And again, I do think some of the regional cities in the UK are try, you know, trying to give London a, 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 run, a run for its money. But actually, London's just so big and so global, it's going to be hard. But um, so I think, again, it, it's your view of what's the outlook for Manchester um, and what's the strength of that cash flow that have rents got upside there compared to, say, London. So, again, I, I don't think the train is massively make or break for the London for the Manchester economy specifically. Manchester's got great connections to London. Um, it would have been a little bit faster, but, you know, a lot of people that power the Manchester housing market and the Manchester rental market work in Manchester. They don't commute from London or necessarily need in, immediate access to London. So, you know, you're really making investment there in the, in the Manchester housing market. Um, and I, I you said that, that quite a lot of people in the BBC commute, don't they? Exactly. I mean, that's uh, I did, daily. I mean, sort of a, but I think it's, it's a point, Mark, around is the how fundamental is HS2 to the Manchester economy and housing market? Yes. It, it's, it, I'm sure it would have had a small net beneficial impact, but I think it's much more about opening up access to the whole of the north of England um, was the bigger play there. I, think that's it. I, I agree with you. My view is, is London is still the capital city. And while you can do well, I in, in secondary city, Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham, the point is there will there is quite a lot of excess supply coming in Manchester now. And I think you will, that oversupply may cause a problem coming. But, you know, as you say, it depends on the Manchester economy. And um, this is a good question. And what is the luxury market in London like for rental and for purchase? Do you do anything on luxury end of the market or should um, we try and answer it depends what you define. I mean, yeah, we do track what's happening at the sort of top five percent of the market. I mean, again, it's it's been a pretty similar pattern, but again, you you might be closer to the to the to the to what's happening in the sort of really prime bits of Knightsbridge and Mayfair, etc. I mean, we. I mean, our, my view is is that the the prime super prime areas and luxury areas, if you like, of 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 central London has been, you know, in terms of capital values, they've come off over the last ten years. They have come off. Having said that, the rental growth has, the rents have stayed largely flat and have increased over the last couple of years. And what that's meant is going from a yield of anywhere from one and a half to two percent gross, that's now moved up to two, two and a half, three percent. And actually, if you are buying super prime luxury properties, then actually, I think that's a good thing for you. Because a lot of investors don't want to touch that market unless you're parking money, and unless there's a specific reason you're buying super expensive properties, i.e., you might want to live there or it's a trophy asset. But I think in terms of the sales market, it has come off, and I think it's starting. We're, we're starting to see prices start to creep up a little bit. The other thing that and, and rentals we've seen growth because there isn't much available, so we've we've seen genuine growth. The whole market. When I talk about the rental market. I'm talking about the whole market from the smallest studio all the way up to large houses. There's growth across the market and re strong rental demand. The one thing I would say is that um, super expensive properties have a very, very specific market. So often it's not, they, they don't rent because the right person isn't there. And then all of a sudden they rent very quickly. But on lot, if you're buying an expensive property, you're likely to have a longer void. Tenant will stay in a 10,000, 20,000 pound a week house for three, four, five years, but you might have a six month void. Whereas if you do what we would, what I was saying earlier, and you invest on the outskirts, where it's purely an investment decision and you're getting a six, 7% yield in some cases, then you won't have any void because there's so many people chasing. You know, you'll have a couple of days void which is often the agent driven in order to make sure it's clean and anything's fixed. And, and you'll see that income come in. And I think that if you're investing, it's a much safer bet. Having said that, you know, the luxury market reflects the rest of the London market and London is an expensive place. So a lot of properties are viewed as luxury anyway. And, 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 and we're seeing the market's very busy. So yeah, I'm 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 quite quite I'm quite strongly believing in the luxury market's gonna continue. 
Um, someone asked another question about, is Zone 4 London considered a good price for a new one-bed flat region of 380 to 398, 390,000 pounds compared to other areas? Richard? Still one for you, isn't it? Sort of, yeah, uh... I, I think it could be one for you. I, I mean, I think, for, I, honestly, I think so. My, my honest view is, is Zone 3, Zone 4, Zone 5. Okay, the zones in London, let's be honest, let me start with that. I think the zones is totally nonsense. Everybody talks about zones all the time. And zone one, a bit in the middle, you have some very, very, very nice stuff and you have some not so nice stuff. So I think zones for me really aren't important, but people focus them all the time. And you have parts of zone two that are much nicer than parts of zone one and same with zone three. But where we've been selling a lot and I've bought myself is zones three to five where if you can buy a one-bedroom flat for three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand pounds, so in this region, um, that's a good price compared to other zones, and you will see a, 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 a yield of six percent. So actually, I, I, I genuinely think that's a, that's the strategy that we are, we are taking at the moment, and I think you get much higher rental yields by being in different areas. Okay, what about this, Richard? Maybe you can do this. What type of property will be in the highest demand moving forwards? You know, especially now with rising service charges affecting buyers and investors. Well, as you said, I think new build has still got a lot going for it. Um, lower running costs. It's built to a higher energy standard, etc. cetera. Um, and again, but maybe buying a, a sort of, a re, you know, a, a new build within the last um, five to 10 years um, could be a good idea. I think there's better value in this in the truly older stock secondhand market, but you do need to do your research onto your ground rents, your service charges, your it's there's probably some real deals to be done there, but you really have got to sort of sift through and really, really understand those costs of that property and how much money is spent. It I think so. Yeah, I think if you want an easier life and don't want to pay a full new build premium, um, you know, you could buy something that's slightly old and new. Um, but again, being really clear on the service charges and the ground rents. And then I think there are opportunities, again, certain types of property that probably hold their value better, easier to maintain than sort of a, a classic sort of a three bed house that's been converted into four flats. Not very well. I mean, no landlord to chat. I, th I, th I think that's really valid. I think people often think it's cheaper buying secondhand older properties and they do represent good value. But you have to bear in mind there's maintenance. What's underlying? Are there damp issues? Are there problems? Are you are you you know lending yourself up to having to put in a new kitchen or bathrooms? They might look nice. What are the appliances like? There's an awful lot of research that goes into the state of the property. So you know we still find a lot of clients buying. You know we, we recommend buying brand new. It's it, it's also about the process, which a lot of people don't understand. In the UK, if you buy a property second hand. You don't really buy it until you actually pay your money. And that can take you three, four, six months. And you spend money on lawyers, money on valuers, money on surveyors, money with your bank, all of those things. And then the seller can sell to somebody else. And, and it's, so it's not like, it's not an easy process. Yes, British people do it all the time. But when you're thousands of miles away, it's a real problem. And I, 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 if you want to do it, it's absolutely fine. But you have to know there's risks involved. So we're truly, we think it's much better to buy from a developer, you know, one of the less expensive schemes in the further out where you can pay reservation fee, which holds it 10% on exchange and maybe another stage payment and then the balloon payment on completion when it's done. I think it's much more sensible. And I think... You know, at the end of the day, I think that it may cost you a little bit more, but that money gets lost in the, in the time anyway, if you own a property for the medium to long term, which is what we recommend anyway. OK, so so here's the last couple of questions. We're over the given the elections next year, you know, maybe you want to take a punt at, at one or the other who is going to be or both. What do we think the property outlook is going to be like? Is it because someone asked you, would it make sense to sell my property now or just hold it? We've had this debate before, Mark. I think holding to buy again is just fool's gold, isn't it, really? So it's sort of the yeah. market, the market never falls. So I think 
you know, only sell if you really, really want to sell, basically. I think the the election, it's bad enough predicting the housing market, let alone politics. I mean, it, you know, if you believe the polls, then, you know, we could well see a, a, a sort of centrist Labour government who will probably, again, probably pick up a lot of the sort of what, what's currently um, happening. Um, and again, it's all about supporting the economy. So I do think some parts of the sort of housing market, people are holding back and waiting. Typically in the first two or three months, in the run up to an election, people just tend to sit on their hands for no good reason other than there's just some uncertainty around. And I think, I think there would be either way, as long as it's not a hung parliament, I just think there'd be a, I think there'd be a bit of a post-election bounce, but I think selling a property now, I don't know quite what that person's pushing it in terms of why would you sell now with a view to buying back after an election? It's, it's I, probably I, going to be I, I, I think that question's around, do we think with the election coming, if, if Labour get in, is there going to be a property slump? And I think absolutely not, because I think it'd be a centrist Labour government, even though I'd rather have a Conservative government, but I'm not in politics. So we are. I think there's a high chance we will. And I don't think they'll do anything that's going to affect the market anymore. And in fact, I hope they'll do the opposite and they'll come in where the Conservatives failed and, and allow more building stock, which 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 we desperately need. Um, but, but I think it's at, but but selling and rebuying is is bonkers if if that's your strategy because you lose so much money in the soft costs. So it's better you buy, you hold on to it, refinance it, and use that money for something else rather than rather than doing it. And I know we're almost up to the hour. So I here, here's the prediction: When do we? Where this is the last question that someone's asked, which I think is the best one to do. So when do you predict the mortgage rates are going to come down to pre-COVID levels? <laughs> that's a pre great question pre yeah they were well, I, well it, they, they got as low as two percent basically didn't they one and a half between one and two percent in at the end of 2022 i think i mean i just don't think they're going to get back down to those levels i, agree. I think um, it's i think four to you know four percent uh, low four percent i think is probably the best we can hope for I don't think central banks want ultra cheap money again. And that, that ultra cheap money was all to do with quantitative easing, banks printing money around the world, putting so much liquidity in, rates fell, and bank that you know, banks are not going to print money again. So again, I think you know, if we get into the low fours, that's probably okay. If we were even lucky enough to get into the high threes mortgage rates, that's probably as good as it's going to get. And that, again, by Great. historic standards, that is cheap money, basically. Super cheap. Now, you don't want it to be that cheap. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. And I would love to think as an investor that we're going to see rates go back that low. But, but the reality is it's impossible. And, you know, I think we should, we, I think we'll see Bank of England base rate definitely go sub four percent i'm sure they will because they want to encourage it but remember that the governments have got on the other side they've got savers and savers need to have some income poor pensioners with with zero on their savings for the last couple of years that's pretty pretty shocking and so no i think there's very little chance if you're if you're someone who's holding out for interest rates to go back to pre-covid levels you're going to be holding out forever because i just don't see it um, Richard, thank you very much. We're at an hour and I don't like to run over if I can. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, um, you can email me or, and if you, or any of our overseas teams. Um, a copy of this will be sent out. Thank you for everybody for asking as many questions as you have. Thank you very much, Richard, for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it. And as I said, afterwards, um, a copy of this will be sent out to you. As, as I said, any questions you want to buy, want to sell, want to rent, want to let, get in touch. We love to help you. Thank you very much.